Welcome to the Eyes Up Mindset Podcast, where we explore what it means to grow daily and find our best in every aspect of life. Welcome back to another episode of the Eyes Up Mindset Podcast. I'm John Shirky, here with my friend and co-host, Jamie Wagner. Joining us today is James Leith, former leadership director at IMG Academy, just outside of Tampa. He's a national speaker. He's got workshops online, webinars. He's got all sorts of resources on his website. Jamie, tell us a little bit more about James and what you got out of the conversation. Well, it was just awesome to connect with somebody that does kind of the same work that we do. Um, he's a little bit farther down the path. Again, kind of we're, we're experiencing that, that there are people out there doing this work that are awesome, that have unbelievable resources and tools that are available to us. You know, working with athletes on the mental side of performance and and learning how to handle the things that maybe we didn't know how to handle ourselves when we were going through it. And so um, he has an awesome book recommendation on his website that if you're looking for resources, he pulled a bunch of coaches and they gave him their favorite books. So check that out. Um, but he just has some really down to earth applicable stuff for us as people that work with young people, but it goes beyond that also. It, it, obviously we talk about this stuff applying broadly in life. And if, if you're listening and you're like, how does this apply to me? He's talking a lot about coaches or kids, like just dig a little deeper because it's there for us to mine and get some good stuff out of. Yeah. I, I thought he challenged us and he, like you said, he, he did the trifecta. He, he entertained, he challenged us and he gave us applicable tools that you could start using tomorrow or today in whether you're a parent, a coach, a, a leader in a business, it doesn't matter. They apply. So go out and start using them. Um, James Leith. James, welcome to the Eyes Up Mindset Podcast. Great to have you, my man. Thank you, John. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. So you said you just got off the plane in Tampa. What were you doing over there? I was um, going in between Tampa and or actually Florida and Alabama. I had some family stuff going on and I needed sure. a trip. And so I just took three days. There's a ton of driving, a ton of hard work, but um, everything got taken care of and got my flight back. Everybody was masked up. It was very weird, but you got to do what you got to do, man. Was, was that your first time on a flight? I just was traveling this last weekend too. It was my first time flying since – you know, probably last December or something like that. It was wild experience for sure. Yeah. My last gig was in March, uh, early March. And I had stuff planned out for the rest of the year. I was very excited about the year and within a week, everything was canceled. And yeah. so I didn't go anywhere until about a month ago where I just booked a flight to California and just hung out with some friends in Santa Monica. I, I had to do something because I was getting stir crazy here in Dallas I had to get out. And so I went to California. Nothing's open in California, but I, at least I was able to hang out on the beach and, and see some friends. Awesome. So you have your own podcast. You have a business called Unleash the Athlete. You're doing awesome stuff. Tell us a little bit about what you do, because I think we're on the same page and our listeners are going to go, yeah, that sounds like something I can get behind. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. I mean, Unleash the Athlete came out of uh, just really necessity. I was working at IMG Academy, just loving it, just having the time of my life, and my father became ill. And uh, I would visit him every other weekend, fly from Tampa to Dallas, just like I just did. And uh, um, finally, I just had to, I had to resign my job and move to Dallas to take care of him. He had a stroke, and so I was able to hang out with him for eight months until he passed. And uh, then I just kind of stayed – in Texas, but I sent out a newsletter. I sent out a coach note, which is like a newsletter every week. And I just sent little anecdotes, uh, stories and stuff, lessons that I've learned and lessons other people have learned. And uh, just said, hey, if anybody wants to hire me, uh, I am available. And the next weekend I was on a flight to Chicago working with Batavia High School basketball and spent the whole weekend there talking about leadership and mental resiliency and character development. And we had a parent meeting and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to keep on doing this. And so basically what Unleash the Athlete is, is all the things that I wish I knew when I was a young athlete. The, the thought processes, the, the self-talk, the mindfulness, 
I mean, you'd be amazed at the lessons you can teach uh, an eighth grade athlete that apply to a professional athlete uh, from, sorry, my cat was playing with this little wrapper. <laughs> but you would be amazed at the, the stuff that you can teach an eighth grader all the way through a professional athlete, like, like breathing. Uh, one of the last times I was with a professional basketball team, this guy, one of the athletes was going back and forth on the court to get himself tired to shoot a free throw. And so he did that and then he jumped right in the free throw and shot it and missed it. And the coach had given me permission to walk up to any athlete during practice, which in itself is like crazy. Like these are million, these are, these are athletes, these are professional athletes. But I stopped him and I go, what are you doing? And he goes, Oh, what do you, what do you mean? I said, you're breathing through your shoulders. Like you're like breathing and your shoulders are going up. I was like, you're, you're not fully taking in a good breath. He's like, I don't know what you mean. I was like, all right, let's do this. Take another lap, get your heart rate back up. So he takes off to the other side which first amazed me. I was like, I just told this guy to run. He just did like, wow, I, who am I? And then he comes back and I was like, all right, put your hand on your belly and breathe so that your hand goes out. And I just said, do that three times and then do go through your dribble routine and then shoot. And so he did that. And right before he shot, he was like, I caught my breath. I feel like my heart rate is down. I'm like, that's good awareness. Fantastic. And then I'm just praying to God that he makes it, right? Because <laughs> like, that would be instant credibility. And he, nothing but the bottom of the net. And I was like, okay, so now part of your routine when you're dribbling is breathing through your belly. And that's, that's something that you can do for a, a seventh grader. That could be, you know, just, just relaxing it and reducing anxiety. I didn't have that stuff when I was younger. When I would walk up to the plate ready to hit and, you know, I hadn't warmed up because I wasn't starting. I, I wasn't a very good baseball player, but I could run bases and I was a good outfielder. But I guess basically I just couldn't hit. But I, I would be so anxious when I was at the plate that I would just swing, ah, whatever. I was swinging anything. And I just wish that I had the, the techniques that I teach through Unleash the Athlete to just relax, to, to calm down the anxiety to speak to myself in a, in a more productive way instead of being like, you suck. I'd be like, well, what was I focused on? What was my footwork? You know, when an athlete, when a soccer player misses a, a practice kick into the goal, you can say, oh, why am I so terrible? Or you can be like, where was my foot placement? Where was my focus? How was my body standing? These are questions that you'll answer, but you'll also answer the, why do I suck? you know what why am I no good and body be like because you just are you're just you'll never be you'll never amount to whatever and if we don't instruct our our minds to speak to us in a way that's productive however that is then we could be at the mercy of all the junk that we've brought we've taken in from media from you know television and radio and and music and video games you know these things they stick with us and if we're not careful they will dictate our decisions so, so you mentioned it's amazing what you can teach a eighth grade athlete or an eighth grader that applies throughout their life. But how do you get, I mean, this is a personal question from me, but also we have a lot of parents, coaches that listen to our podcast that how do I get them to believe in this? Because as an eighth grader, it's a very different mindset than as a professional athlete who's training. Yes, he's at practice, but he's willing to, to accept some feedback. Eighth graders are, generally a little less open to or available to some of these concepts. So how do you go about getting that to land with some of those types of individuals? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Uh, the messenger matters. The person delivering the message matters. Mom and dad don't know what they're talking about. According <laughs> to the athlete, right? The son or daughter looks at mom and dad like, you know, I, I see you at home sitting on the couch, eating potatoes, yelling at the referee and having a bad Monday because your football team lost on Sunday. And you're going to tell me how to be mentally tough. Like the, the kid doesn't know how to express that, but subconsciously they're feeling that. And so that's why parents, they find it a very difficult to teach their kids these things. Also, they, they've kind of ruined their ability to uh, connect with, the, with their young athlete because the car ride home is so dramatic and they want to talk to the kid. And the kid's like, I'm still processing how much I just stunk up the court. And so a lot of times parents want to help their kids, but the kid is just, they've turned off that, that part of themselves. You know, a parent has to earn the voice that the coach is just given automatically. 
because they're the coach, which makes it very difficult if mom or dad are the coach. And, uh, you know, for if, if you're listening and you are a parent, one of the strategies you can use is to, when you get, when you take the kid to practice in the car, just be like, Hey, I'm about to put my coach hat on. Is there anything you want to tell dad? Is there anything you want to tell mom? And then they're like, no, I'm good. And then when you get out of the car, like you put the hat on. And even if you have a physical hat, like it, it tells the kid, we have now shifted the relationship to now I'm your coach. And I'm not going to talk to you about making your bed unless it's a team lesson. But when we get back to the car, I'm going to have my hat on. And I'm going to be like, is there anything you want to tell coach? Because once I take the hat off, it's all giggles and ice cream. And, and I've done this before with, uh, with kids that – um, it doesn't, I mean, this was 10 years ago or something, but I had a kid on my football team who needed a place to stay for a few days. And this is where I learned that. I was just like, listen, Daylon, do you have anything to tell coach before I take the coach hat off? Because when I take the coach hat off, we're going to go home and play Madden. Like <laughs> we're going to go home and do your homework and we're going to make dinner and we're going to hang out. Um, and, and it took a few days, but then eventually he was like, yeah, you know, I do have a question about this one drill that we did. And then I would take my hat off and he would want to talk about football. And I'd be like, you have to wait till coach comes back tomorrow, <laughs> you know, and it makes it more fun for the kids because they just, they're like, Oh, okay. So you can play different roles, but the life application to doing something like that goes a long way because then the kid realizes, oh, okay, dad can be more than dad. Mom can be more than mom, that they can be other roles depending on different circumstances. So then the kid's like, Oh, so I don't have to be just, this person i can be different versions of the person depending on the circumstance i think that's amazing that's a advice i i yeah i taught for nine years you know uh -huh. and one of the things that i say all the time is that these teenagers because i worked with teenagers primarily is they know and are more capable than we give them credit for in this in this profession as parents like they're just super super capable but we give them and we assign them a role and we say this is who you are to me because in my class you're the troublemaker in my class you're the screw off in my class you're the smart kid whatever it might be and then we expect them to meet those roles with consistency i think that's just tremendous advice for you know because there are times where i'm giving life advice and i'm not mr wagner the spanish teacher right i you know i'm the coach or I, and they see us in different roles. Let's give them the power to have different roles as well. I think that's a, that's an amazing piece of information that you just gave there. So, you know, it, and, and also the, the transition is huge. Sorry to cut you off, John, but like the transition is huge and, and the ability to actually make a big deal out of, we are transitioning from the type of conversations that we were having to the type of conversations that you need to have because you need mom, you need dad. You know, and also it's the same thing for a teacher. If it's a teacher or coach, I remember in eighth grade, you guys ever watched uh, Boy Meets World? Remember that show? Absolutely. Mr. Feeney awesome. just followed Corey and Topanga. <laughs> to follow. Well, I yep. had a coach like that. It was Mr. Gabriel. He was my sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade coach in multiple sports. He was also my math teacher. And so during class, he'd be like, I'm not your coach right now. I'm your teacher. And then during practice, I'd be like, hey, Coach, what was the uh, what was the homework assignment? He was like, I don't know. Ask your teacher. And I'm like, what do you what do you mean? You're my teacher. He's like, No, I'm not. I'm your coach. And then I was so confused. But I'm 13 years old, and I asked him in class. I was like, What What did you mean? You're not my teacher. You're right here. He goes, When I'm at practice, I'm your coach. When I'm in the classroom, I'm your teacher. And the conversations need to follow accordingly. And there's always exceptions to the rules, you know, I've learned, but I learned that lesson really early. And then I, I applied it later on when, you know, I had that student stay with, with me and my family. And so it, it's important to make a big deal out of those transitions. And it's the same thing when the kid goes from school into sports. So if, if you're a coach listening, you, you got to know that those kids get to your practice at 3.30. Well, they've been sitting down in a desk all day long, looking up at a teacher or now staring into a green light on a screen and then they just go into practice and these coaches were like okay you're ready to turn it on the kid's like no i had drama in at lunchtime because i had to stand in line and i missed i couldn't hang out with so and so and i was supposed to meet my friend and all this other stuff happened but they're not professional athletes and they're not many adults they're children and as coaches sometimes we forget that they need some time to transition 
Anson Dorns had a, a thing that he did. He was a soccer coach, collegiate soccer coach, legendary. And he would give his uh, female athletes an opportunity to run around the field at whatever pace they wanted to. They could push each other under the bushes. They could joke around. They could do whatever they want. And they knew when they got back to them, practice is now going to begin. But he realized that they needed that time to just be like, we're with our friends. We, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're about to go into battle. And if you can do that, it makes it easier for the athletes to be able to get in that childlike state. Instead of at practice, they get childish, but they're like childlike. There's a very big difference there, but you gave them that transition to realize it's time to work. It's time to compete. It's not the classroom. You're not sitting down pretending to listen to Mr. Wagner talk in Spanish. I mean, you have no idea what he's talking about, right? So there, there <laughs> needs to be that kind of transition in, in, in multiple things because in life, we're always transitioning from thing to thing to thing. Like I just, I went from two and a half hours sitting on an airplane being quiet. And now here I am like speaking. And so you have to be able to transition. Well, I think so a couple of things for me that I'm just convicted by and also grateful for at the same time. I, as a kid, my dad was my basketball coach all throughout, you know, when I was younger and up through high school. And most of the time I really enjoyed it. We, we never had this sort of transition that specific of language. He did a pretty good job of, of transitioning. I didn't always do a good job because, you know, when I fouled out of a basketball game and he got mad at me, or if I got a technical in a basketball game, which in my younger years, I was fairly competitive and feisty and maybe said some things and did some things that I'm not broke super proud of, but I learned. Bats, What's yeah. that? I broke a few yeah. base mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I think just, I'm, like I said, I'm incredibly grateful for that time because now I look back and, and for all those times that I was frustrated, now I look back and I'm like, yeah, I learned this from, you know, my dad teaching me that in that setting or, or this setting or whatever. And, and then I think the, the, the last point you just made, it's because our, we deal with not only athletes, but parents and businesses and, and just people in general trying to get better. And I think as adults, if we don't learn this skill as a high school athlete, this transitioning skill, I think about how many of us as adults come home from work or from wherever you just got off a plane. But I think of myself coming home, if I had a bad day at work or a tough thing, I come home and I haven't made that transition or I don't have that physical routine. And now my wife asked me something that may or may not be, you know, what I think she just said, it could set me off because I didn't take that time to, run around the field, collect myself and say, Hey, you know what? I'm going from work to now I'm a husband and a, and a friend, you know, there was, yeah, there was this uh, great coach, uh, coach Kazarian, Ed Kazarian. He coached football at UCLA and he came to my high school that the high school that I was coaching varsity football at. And, uh, he was like, I was taking him to the airport and I was like, Hey man, uh, what's something as a young coach that I can learn? And he goes, Oh, there's only one thing. There's only one thing that I can teach you that will help you exponentially. He said, when you get into the driveway after practice, don't bring practice to the dinner table. Like your wife doesn't want to see it. Your kids don't want to hear about it. When you are in the driveway, tell your family not to come out. Just wait. Maybe you need a couple more minutes. Maybe you need one more Celine Dion song or whatever song, like whatever <laughs> thing is going to, maybe you need to listen to the last few minutes, Joe Rogan, you know, whatever it is, like you need to do something to uh, transition to go from coach and yelling and in charge to loving father, loving husband, loving member of the family. Don't bring it in. They don't deserve that. And you can do that over years and years and decades. And all of a sudden realize like you've missed out on so much because you, your inability to go from coach to family member. Yeah. And what you're talking about is the capacity to create, moments or habits that draw out awareness, right? I mean, we are, we become aware of the role that we were in and then become aware of the role that we're going to go into. And when you're talking to people that work in mental performance, it's all about awareness and your capacity to see and understand what's going on with you in a given moment. When you're working with young people, how do you draw their attention inward right 
Like how do you, because so much of our focus is, and it's not just young people, let's be honest, right? It's every one of us. Our, our focus is attending to the outcome. It's attending to the outward response that other people are going to have to us. How do we then look inside and find the tools that we have available to us or the problems, the hiccups that we kind of engage with every day? Because that's as hard as it gets. I think. Uh, Jamie, I think it's important for a coach to understand the value of social intelligence, being able to go all across the spectrum of your emotions. I'm a, I'm a passionate guy. When I coach, I'm pretty, I'm pretty even, I'm pretty even keel. I, I, I'm, I don't get upset. I don't get too excited. Um, but I'm just kind of there. And every once in a while, I, I get, I, I, I lose it and lose my mind. That's what they think, but I'm in full control. And I had a situation last week where I'm a wide receivers coach at Trinity Christian Academy. And uh, my JV guys were playing very soft. And I kept telling them, I'm like, guys, you need to step up. We need to, you know, we're working on, on getting off the block and this isn't going to work. And I come from some very aggressive schools on Florida and California, and now I'm in Texas, this is not gonna cut it. You know, we haven't won a game, this school hasn't won a game in two seasons, so this isn't gonna cut it. And so we went back on the line and they did the exact same thing. And I said, all right, everybody line up. And I took my hat off and I took my glasses off and I lost my voice. <laughs> I yelled and I went off on them. And the, the look on their faces just made me wanna go louder. And then when I was just about to quit, the head coach walks up behind me and I was like, you know what? He needs to see this too. And I just kept on going, rah, rah, rah. And then I said, now bring it in, bring it in. And then when they came in there, I put my hat on and I went right back to speaking. Guys, that's the kind of energy I need to see out of you. That kind of immediate emotional transition will shake an adult or a child right away. And I said, is everybody comfortable with what I said and can you step up and do what I asked and they were like yes sir I'm like oh geez like they scared me they've never yelled at me like that so I lined up and I had nine groups or nine partners and when I blew the whistle I had nine fights going on on the line and I let it go a little bit and then I blew my whistle and I came in I go look from now on I want to tell you how to bring it down I don't want to push you to go harder and I want you to remember this moment. And then, you know, you do something to kind of like, you know, clap or something. And then we, we had some fun. I was like, all right, now go get some water. Now they have time to think about it. But kids don't think inwardly. They're, they're selfish. Like the world revolves around them. The world revolves around me. The world revolved around you, John, around you, Jamie. Like that's, how, that's what kids are doing. They don't have the life experience to realize that there are other people that are affected by their actions. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a part of growing. We fail as coaches when we think our kids are able to do that when as adults, we're not able to do that. So we have to display the emotional resiliency and the emotional flexibility for them to be able to, to, to mimic what we're, you know, and to do what we're asking them to do. You know, if, if I'm on the sideline and the ref makes a bad call and I throw my clipboard down, and then, and, and then pick it up and I'm, I'm angry and I'm yelling. And three plays later, one of my players yells at the ref and gets a 15 yard penalty. Whose fault is that? That's my fault. I, sh I literally showed the kid how to do that. I modeled it for them. And kids will do what they see. They're not listening to what we say. I, I, prime example, I had a call, it's been two years now, from this kid who was a sixth grader on my football team now he's like a 21 year old and he calls me up and he was like, coach, my, you know, I'm 21. I'm in college. I'm wrestling. And, and I was like, I, I know I see you on Facebook. I'm so proud of you. And he was like one of the best wrestlers in the country. And the last time I talked to him was he was a sixth grader on my football team. Even when he called me, it said Maddie's mom. Like I it didn't even say his name. I guess he got his mom's phone number. Right. And so <laughs> I was like, bro, it's so great to hear from you. You know, your voice is up. Last time I heard him, he was like, Hey coach. Now he's like, Hey coach, how you doing? I'm like, wow, you've really grown. And I, he goes, uh, my, my teacher asked me to reach back to a coach that influenced me positively and, I, and, and write a report on it. I want to I write it on you. So I was like, you know, this is what we live for. This is what we coach for. 
And so I said, you know, Maddie, what do you remember about those times together? Now, for some backstory, he was on a football team where we went undefeated. We destroyed teams. And I mean, I had eight plays, one formation. It was football. And we just killed teams. We didn't get scored against. And he was on both those teams. And I thought he was going to talk about that. And he goes, uh, do you still open up the door for Mrs. Coach Lee? And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? He's like, whenever she would come pick you up, you would walk around and you would, and she'd, she'd walk out to the field and you'd walk around and you'd open up the door for her and she'd get in and you'd walk around and you'd take off. And I was like, you saw me do that? He goes, yeah, coach, I've been doing it ever since. He's like, girls love it. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, they do. Like, he's like, why do you do it? And I was like, well, it's, you know, I know she can do it on her own, but it's a matter of respect. It, it's how I show her that I love her. He goes, oh man, that's cool. And he goes, do you still teach the handshake on the first day of practice? Of course, this is way before pre-COVID, right? So I was like, yes. And so what I would do is I would line them all up and I'd teach them how to shake hands and how to introduce themselves and how to make eye contact with me. And, and uh, that's how they would introduce themselves. And I'm like, yeah, I still do. He goes, well, coach, I'm a wrestler and I'll get out there on the mat and they'll give me the princess or the dead fish. And then I grab their arm and I was like, shake it like you mean it. He's like, I learned that from you. And that's, he goes, coach, it's psychological warfare. And I was like, wow, I'm going to start calling it that. That's fantastic. You know? And so that's a lesson that he watched me do 10 years before, eight years before. And so as coaches, we have to remember that they're always watching us. And as a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I went back to my elementary school. I mentioned Mr. Gabriel and I was standing with my finger on my chin and my elbow resting on my arm. And I was looking at the team or whatever. And I hear this like old raspy voice, like, Hey, Jimmy, you making fun of me. And I look over and he's standing exactly the same way. I have no idea. And I'm looking at my hands. I was like, I have pictures of me standing this way for the last 10 years. And I'm like, after that, I was like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Like, sorry, coach. Like, I mean, no disrespect, but I picked that up from him just by watching him. I had no idea. And so these kids are always, always watching us. And so if they watch us lose our, our control and not be able to get it back, they're going to mimic that. That's powerful. I, we talk about modeling all the time. Modeling is not like, I, it's like the excellence is a habit kind of quote, you know, it's not, you know, we are what we do repeatedly excellence, you know, like we, what we demonstrate repeatedly is what the kids are going to see too. It's not just this one off. Right. And, and sometimes you lose it, it one time, you do one thing. Yeah, and the kid's yeah. like, you remember when you did that? And I was like, I, I don't know. My roommate. So he just moved in. We were college roommates and he just went through some stuff. And so he's now living with me for a little bit. And he's like, man, one time you told me this one thing and he'll say it. And I was like, I said that, hold on. Let me write that <laughs> down. That's amazing. He's like, bro, it changed my life. I'm like, Whoa, let me write that down. It's <laughs> but true. Like said, man, like the things that we repeatedly do, it's going to be their habits. They're going to pick those up as like, I want to be like coach. We have Billy Graham said a coach will influence more people in a year than most people in a lifetime. And we all know that that's true. These kids are influenced by us for negative and positive for the rest of their lives. We're a byproduct of the people that poured into us as kids. So James, it's just James, so good. It is so good. And I mean, it's I, lasagna, man, it's hitting me right. You know, I had monster and lasagna. I'm ready to go, man. Let's go. That's the winning combination. So, I guess so. you mentioned that you're back coaching. Um, did you take some time off? Why'd you decide to get back in? I mean, obviously you yeah. love football and you love athletes, but how'd you get back into it or why, why now? Well, so I, I played football for almost 15 years and went from elementary school all the way into like semi-pro and arena football and uh, absolutely loved it. And then, and I'd been coaching for uh, since eighth grade, which is a whole nother story, but I, I always knew I wanted to be a coach. And so when I went to Fresno state to play ball, I got hurt. And long story short, I ended up being on a cheer team and being the mascot. And so I had this like front row view of the basketball and the football and like Derek Carr went to Fresno State. So he'd scoot across the end zone and we'd do a celebration dance. And I was a bulldog. So like he'd like walk me across the end zone. It was like a lot of fun, but I, I knew that I wanted to be a coach. And so I just started coaching. And then one year uh, I, I decided to take a year off and just study. 
And so for the whole year, whenever I would be at practice, because I was a multi-sport coach, I'd be in the library or I'd be watching documentaries. And I was like 25 or 26. And during that time, one of my friends was a head football coach in Morro Bay, California. And he was like, hey, man, my kids are quitting. I, I'm, I'm losing kids. Can you come and find out? Like, maybe, can you see anything? I was like, yeah, sure. He's like, I'll pay you. And I was like, mm, if someone says they're going to pay you, just shut your mouth. Just let them pay you. <laughs> so I was like, mm, okay. And so uh, I show up to this practice. And uh, right away, this kid comes up to the coach. I see the problem right away. This kid comes up to the coach and he's like, coach, my neck hurts. It's football. And, uh, and the coach looks at him and goes, yeah, mine too. And rubs the back of his neck. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm about to punch this coach in the face. Like this coach, this kid is trying to like talk to his coach. Even if the kid's lying, he's obviously asking for attention. And so the coach dismisses him. He's like, well, go sit down and whatever, you know, when you're ready to, you know, stop being a baby and come back. So then he goes away and the coach is like, all right, sports psych. Like I, I was barely like out of college at that time. And I, he's like, how'd I do? And I was like, well, that kid's going to quit. And he's a sophomore. You'll never get him back. He's like, ah, oh, that's the way my coach talked to me. I'm like, coach, you're 50 years old. That was a long time ago. These kids don't get to talk like, like that. However, I went and I watched some of the other coaches. The other coaches spoke to the kids exactly the same way. Very condescending, very sarcastic. Now there's a place for being condescending and sarcastic for the kids that can, un that can take that. But not every kid can take that. When I was in high school, if a coach yelled at me, I didn't get yelled at home. Like I would shut down. It wasn't until college where I learned in semi-pro it was like, all right, I just need to be okay with it because they're just going to yell. So two weeks later, he texts me. He's like, you're right. He quit. I was like, yeah. But he also gave me $500 for it. And I was like, hmm, I think I'm going to make a website and start doing this. And so I started doing that. And so after a couple of years, I would still coach, but I would be called out and I would watch all these practices and I would help with getting the, the coaches more efficient and, uh, you know, getting it more fun, putting, giving the game back to the kids. And just over time, like that just kind of became what I did. And it led to me going back to school to get my master's degree in performance psychology and led me to get a job at IMG Academy as the head of leadership development. And uh, even when I was at IMG, I was still coaching uh, random U YMCA stuff. So when I moved to Dallas, uh, I hadn't started coaching. I was just taking care of my dad and I was speaking. And I, I realized that my stories were getting old. I was getting stale. And if I'm a coach of coaches, I can't rest on the stuff that I've done way in the past. I never wanted to be that guy. So I just dove back into the trenches and I started coaching um, youth football and YMCA basketball and volunteering for a baseball team. And, and then finally, like, you know, varsity football in Texas, which is everything everybody thinks it is. It's a religion. I, I work harder for this team than I've ever done at coaching, but immediately it's given me better insight. Um, I, I just read a text from one of my receivers who is like, coach, you know, you told me to ask if I, uh, on what I can do to become better. And I'm asking you, and I never thought I would get that text from him, but somehow I won him over. And so I can't wait to see him tomorrow and tell him, you know, what, what he can do. It's easy. Learn the plays. Like for him, it's easy. Right. But like some kids, it's like, look, you just need to be more aggressive. You need to do this. But point is, is that I started coaching again because I never wanted my stories to get stale. And when I come on, you know, shows like yours or talk on my own podcast, uh, I don't want to just be retelling the same old stories over and over because kids change parenting. Kids don't change a lot. Parents change a lot and what they have to go through. And then just recently with COVID, I can't imagine being able to intelligently talk about athletes going through COVID, just sitting behind a microphone and not actually coaching kids through COVID. And so it's a blessing for me to be able to continue to coach and be able to continue to give back from what all the other coaches that gave to me growing up. Cause I, like I said, I was multi-sport athlete and I, I just learned a lot from my coaches. And so I just want to keep passing that message on. Well, I, I think another good example of, Hey, here's, here's a, an example from sport that transcends into our lives too, mm -hmm. where it's like, Hey, you know what? Don't be stale in, in your business. Yeah. You know, if you're a leader in business, if you're a parent, how do you stay relevant? Yes, there's, there is a place for this is how I learned, but it has to be melded to what is current. How do, how do kids communicate now? I think about 
my uh, brother and sister-in-law, they have three daughters in high school now. And, you know, they're on TikTok and they're on Snapchat and they're, they do those things with their daughters because that's the language that they're speaking. And that's what you're saying is how do you stay relevant to your clientele, whether that's athletes or your employees or your family, it's don't, don't get stale. Continue, yeah, to, you know, there's, continue there's, to learn and grow every day. Absolutely. So there's so many things that you said, or, or I agree with in that, like as a coach, you can be a coach for 20 years and have one year's experience 20 times or 20 years of experience growing from growing from like, excuse me. you you grow from experiences. Um, I've got, I've read every Harry Potter book. I could care less about a orphaned wizard with friends and ghouls and everything. But whoa. My kids, whoa. My, yeah. How, let me give him a chance to explain himself. Okay. okay. All right. Just check. And so I was like, I'm not going to read that. That's dumb, you know, but then my kids were reading that my athletes were reading that. So of course I dove in. And now when I'm out on the field or in the court, I can be like, look, let's talk about delegation all right, who's read Harry Potter? And they're like, well, you know, everybody. And I'm like, me too. Let's talk about Harry and how he delegates on, he has certain skills that he knows. And then he has certain skills he doesn't have. And he uses his friends. And they're just like, wait a minute. Coach is talking about Harry Potter. I remember one time I was at uh, IMG and I, I was working with this tennis group and I wasn't doing very well with them. Cause I couldn't, I, for some reason I couldn't relate to 11 year old tennis players. This group was tough. But I knew if I got their leader, their ringleader, every group has a ringleader, that I would get the group. And so I downloaded Pokemon Go and I made sure he saw me when he walked through the gym. And I had my phone and I was flicking on the phone and he saw me and he's like, coach, what are you doing? I go, there's Pokemon over here by the dumbbells. And he's like, what? He comes over and he turns on his phone. And he's like, oh my gosh. And he's got all these like, you know, he's way more advanced than I am. I downloaded it five minutes before. <laughs> And he's like, I didn't know you did that. I'm like, oh yeah, of course. It's fun. You know, why not? So by the time I got to class two hours later, he had told the entire class that I was into Pokemon Go and I had them. Like they were interested. So then I put him on the spot. I was like, how does Pokemon Go relate to tennis? He's like, I don't know. I was like, make something up. And he got up and he started talking to his peers. This is an 11 year old kid. And he's now learning leadership development. He's now, he's now learning how to use his voice among his peers to speak about a topic that he knows a lot about. Well, that will translate into who knows what else, but we're in a leadership class during summer camp and they just found out coach likes Pokemon Go. I don't care about Pokemon Go, but I care about connecting with my kids. And so I've done that ever since I read the hunger games and you know, like when with my kids, my, my, with my varsity football players, I'm like, what are you reading in English class? And they gave me their list. And I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm like, okay, I've read some of these books. So now if they need to talk about something, I can be like, oh, you're talking about uh, Homer. You're talking about the, 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 the Odyssey. Fantastic. Yeah. How do you think like Te Telemachus felt when he had to go look for his father? And they're like, what? Are you like, yeah, Penelope was probably really lonely for 20 years when o Odysseus was gone. And now I've, I've earned their level of respect on a different, you know, on a way different platform. But I can use that as a coach to be able to, relate to them and to connect with them. Well, and also it serves as a, as a double, uh, you know, double whammy because now if, if you make those references and they don't know what you're talking about, you know, they're not doing their homework. So then, you know, you but can also, encourage them. <laughs> you're right, John, but it also inspires them. Cause like, wait a minute. Absolutely. Cool. Well, how, what does he know about Odysseus? He's talking yep. about Greek yeah. literature. He's like, and then yeah. they're like, you know, when, did you read that in school? I'm like, no, I finished it two weeks ago. And they're like, oh my gosh, you still read. I'm like, yeah, of course I read. And so, and, and even as adults, you know, I, I just bought a piano. I'm no, I don't, I, my, I was in sixth grade. I played the trumpet. I was five minutes late to class. And the music teacher told me I needed to choose between sports and music. And I never touched music again. <laughs> right. And so now like, and I wish I could punch her now and be like, no, I can do both. You're an elementary school music teacher. You can't tell me. <laughs> But I didn't know that as a kid. And so, you know, now here I am 40 years old and I've got a guitar going on and I've got the calluses on my fingers and I'm playing the piano because my roommate knows how to play and he's teaching me. And it, and I suck. I'm really, I, I'm terrible. But what I'm doing is I'm remembering what it is to learn something. And that can also connect me to my football players when they're trying to figure out how to learn this or my basketball players who are trying to learn different types of dribbling and stuff. 
because I have recently learned something. And so we always need to learn something, you know, next year I'm getting my, I was going to do it this year, but cause COVID, but I'm going to get yoga teacher certified. It's not, I don't really want to teach a class, but that's really hard to go through those trainings is a very difficult thing. And so, you know, that's what I'm going to do. We always have to keep on learning and we need to model just like we were talking about earlier. Um, and, and Jamie asked about it was that we always need to be modeling. And if we want our kids to be learning, they need to see that coach continues to learn. I love it. It's, that's my heart in a nutshell. I'm going through the guitar journey myself right now and yeah. I love it. I, I was not good six months ago. I'm still not good, but I am better. And that's, I, I love that message. Be a learner. Right. And I like one of my rules in my classroom is be a learner, not a finisher. Please don't just finish stuff, learn how to do it. And so many of us get caught up and let's finish this thing. Let's get through to the other side. Let's end the journey. Well, if the joy is in the journey, why do we want it to end? You know what I mean? And learning to me is the best way to enjoy it throughout. So uh, I think your message is awesome. We appreciated having you on. It's, it's, I love our podcast because we always get to bring on people like you who give us something to chew on and think about and grow us and, and make us better and uh, let us learn a little bit. So thanks for coming on and enjoying us. Oh yeah. It was my pleasure. John and Jamie, thank you so much for having me. You guys do some good stuff. So uh, keep going. Before, before we let you go, where can people find you if they want to find you online or social media, that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I constantly try to get off online and try to not tweet, not post on Instagram, but I hear you. It's, just, it's just where it's at. And so uh, James Leith um, on all the socials and my, my business website is utathlete.com. I've got some courses on there. I've got um, this one course is called Inner Game for Athletes. It's a six week course. And right now uh, I'm, I'm selling it really cheap and I'm giving the PowerPoint to coaches. And so you can actually teach it on your own. So I've done it live with, with athletes throughout the summer. And now I just want to equip coaches with that PowerPoint. So um, go in there and get it. It's like 75% off or whatever. And uh, you, that, that should be, I think you have to put inner gain 75. That's the, the coupon code, but go grab that. Cool. Well, thank you, sir. Get to your next interview. It's been our pleasure. Uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jamie. Have a great night. Thanks again to James for joining us on the podcast. Incredible takeaways and challenges for me personally. And the utmost for me, Jamie, was the challenge to not be stale, to continue to grow and to learn every day and, and to be relevant. And it doesn't make it doesn't mean that you have to love all of the current literature or music or movies or, you know, approaches to, to leadership or whatever you're, you're doing, but you have to know about them because you have to be able to relate to a wide variety of people. And if, if we're just using the same examples and the same stories over and over, people get sick of it. They shut it off. They, they stop listening. And, and so I think that was challenging for me in my work and in my personal life, you know, and, and in our relationships, it has to be different and it has to be evolving and, and a living thing and keep, continue to grow every day. Well, and learning is this place where you have to jump in and be willing to be terrible. You know, you have to be willing to be a failure at times. Like, and, and he talked about picking up, playing the piano, like I'm bad at it. Yeah. That's what learning is. We start in a really negative place. And we have to remember that when we're working with other people that maybe aren't in the same place as us. And one of the ways that we can do that is to understand the different roles that we play that he was talking about and understanding how we can make transitions from role to role to role and to understand that, hey, when I'm in this position and I'm working with someone that's a peer, they're going to have an understanding that when I go home, my wife my kids aren't going to have. And I have to shut those things off and pick up in a new place. And you might not be as good at that thing. You might have to learn when to transition. And then when you're in that role, you might need to learn while you're there. And so I think those two things combined were just gigantic for me as well. Don't just be complacent. Don't get stale. Learn how to embrace the roles that we have and then get better when you're there. And as always, live eyes up.